All right. Well, welcome everybody. We're just going to wait uh, a few minutes for everybody to log in because we just launched the presentation and it takes a few seconds for everybody to uh, to log in. So just hold on for a few minutes here. Thank you. Okay. Well, what do you think, Brian? You want to get started? Sure. Sounds like right. fun. Let's go. Sounds great. Well, welcome everybody to the second day of the Advanced Manufacturing Summit. Um, today's topic is the Ask the Expert se session. Uh, well, going to be on materials and the importance of material data for analysis accuracy. So Brian and I are going to uh, to host this session. So for those of you that don't mean uh, no, don't know me, uh, my name is Matt Jaworski. I'm a senior subject matter expert on uh, the Autodesk uh, simulation team, um, otherwise known as the Make team, specializing on the simulation side. Um, so been in the industry over uh, you know, a quarter century. Worked at uh, Hewlett Packard, Rubbermaid, and um, Autodesk Moldflow. And Brian, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, we've, you can see here, we've crossed paths. Um, my, my background is uh, plastics engineering from UMass Lowell and uh, also did some time with HP. And uh, actually, it's where I reside now in Corvallis, Oregon. And um, had some interesting uh, applications over the years with simulation, uh, PCC structural specifically. Uh, brought me into a foundry and investment casting and simulating those processes. So pretty wide, broad background and over 30 years applying mold flow and other CAE and FEA tools. Perfect. Thanks, Brian. And I think you guys will notice right away that uh, this one's not recorded. So we're going to be the first presentation maybe that you've seen that's been, um, that's been live. So for those of you that, uh, haven't noticed this one um, is on zoom and most of the other presentations that you've seen have been on um, the on 24 platform and the questions and answers are a little bit different so if you are um, looking at the presentation right now and you kind of move your mouse around you should be able to see you know a chat window the ability to you know, raise your hand and then a question and answer it uh, session or section so when you click in the Q&A uh, section, you should be able to type in your questions into that and, and be able to see them. And we'll try to answer those as we go along. But we figured we'd go through a few slides and then see what kind of questions that we get based on the topics. But if you have a topic that you want to talk about, please, by all means, uh, go into the, uh, the Q&A and uh, put your questions in and we'll, uh, we'll answer those. All right, thanks. So I guess uh, when we start off, we kind of, you know, tried to figure out where we should, you know, take this based on materials. And in, because we were talking about kind of accuracy, I th thought the greatest thing to bring up is, you know, where do we get accurate um, simulation results from? And I kind of think of it like a four pillar system. So when you think about it, obviously material data um, needs to be there. And we need to have that material data accurate based on what we choose in terms of an analysis and what we want to get out of the analysis. Um, the component modeling, so the model that you bring in, the, you know, the part, the, um, 
mold, the tool, uh, the runner system, how many cavities, those types of things all need to be put in as well. And then what mesh type you choose is, is very important. So you need to represent what we're doing over in reality with the proper um, mesh type. You know, we wanna make sure our thicknesses are well represented. We're not using mesh types that aren't um, uh, applicable for the uh, particular geometry. So for instance, if we, we have a, a thick and chunky type of part, we don't want it to, to use um, you know, thin wall assumptions on dual domain or mid-plane type technology, because that may throw off our thickness and uh, you know, we're kind of violating the guidelines for the mesh type that we've chosen. Now, the other thing too, Matt, that I kind of look at these pillars and, and look at it from a pragmatic kind of um, lead time standpoint, and material data is always the first because it still can be the longest lead time as far as getting good quality data. The next sometimes is process conditions. So, you know, meshing and solver technology are what they are. They're some of your hard work and some of the existing commercial technology, um, not a lot of lead time there. So the, those are the, the two that I focus on as far as starting a project and checking that straight away. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, like you said, if you need to get a material tested or you need to you know, track down somebody at a material supplier that can get you, you know, the data that may not be in the database. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. It can be a long lead time. Yeah, and just to round it out, uh, solver technology. So what you use in terms of the um, analysis, if you're changing any of the defaults or if you're using, um, you know, a, a different solver compared to, to another one. And then the process conditions, you want to make sure those match, uh, just accepting all the defaults and mold flow and then expecting it to um, behave the same way your machine does, you know, is wishful thinking. I mean, a lot of times I wish I, you know, had a, uh, a genie bottle went up to the machine and said, make me a part and it did it for me, right? You have to go through the process and making sure that the... Um, uh, that's called mold <laughs> <laughs> it, it is molding. And uh, we need to, uh, you know, go through that process and just because it's in the computer doesn't mean it's going to be an automatic process for us as well. Although we're trying to make it as easy as possible. So I think if we go back to... Uh, the thermoplastic material properties and really thermosets it's pretty much the same except we start to switch things and put curing kinetics and some of those things in but um, you know accurate analysis results really require accurate and relevant material characterization for the analysis objective that we have and I kind of starred that because I'm not saying that you need to have um, you know the most uh, expensive test for everything um, that we need to do for you know, all of the analyses that we're do, uh, we do. There are, you know, quick fill analyses that give us really good results and allow us to make decisions on, you know, uh, material data that, um, you know, may be questionable if we wanted to use that for warpage, for instance. So you have to kind of match the, um, the level of material data that you need with a process and the analysis objective, ob objective that you're actually doing. So I wanted to you know, kind of make that point because we're gonna be talking a lot about um, the details of you know, material testing and what's needed in each of the analysis results. But if you're looking for, is one gate gonna give me a better flow front or um, pressure than another gate or weld lines in a certain area, uh, sometimes just having a similar grade material is, um, is good enough you know, to answer that question. But if we look at, uh, you know, filling, you know, obviously transition temperature, um, you know, that, that kind of um, transition from our, you know, theoretical uh, solid uh, to melt stage, obviously that's a range and we have to, you know, put a, a value in the, um, in the material in order for it to, uh, to determine when that material is um, viscous enough to, to be assumed solid. You know, thermal conductivity, um, specific heat, and then our viscosity. Um, equations are all, you know, really the main foundations for filling. Then we have packing, our PVT, pressure specific volume and temperature. Uh, really the specific volume is what we, um, we measure there. Our inputs are typically our flow rates and those derive our temperature and pressure effects and specific volumes where we're really, you know, moving it up and down the curves and getting our, our shrinkage from. 
And then warpage, we have um, you know, our mechanicals, our elastic modulus, our Poisson's ratio. Um, you know, from those, we can determine the shear modulus. We have coefficient of linear expansion, um, any fiber filler data that we need um, or additives. And that's really if it's a filled material or um, you know, fiber or you know, platelet-based or, or talc-based or, or spherical-based. So there's, um, in addition to regular fibers, we do have you know, aspect ratios that are, that are one as well, that are more filler-like. And then what shrinkage model we use. And um, you know, we have uh, uncorrected residual stress, and then we have corrected uh, residual and molded stress. And right now, the, the corrected version is only for mid-plane and dual domain meshes. So Brian, um, I talked for a few sl slides. You want to take over for, from here from a material quality indicator perspective? Sure. Um, the uh, material quality indicator is, is um, really important thing to, to look at. It's one of the, like I said, the, the long lead times, um, longest lead time in regards to assessing uh, material quality and if you need additional data. Um, so, you know, right there in, in the software, you can see uh, a bronze, silver, gold ranking in regards to the stages of what you're, you know, after. Certainly, if you're just doing a, a flow analysis, um, flow pack, um, th there are, you know, different components that are important for that verse going all the way to the warp. So that's why it's broken out that way. And it's sequential and... Um, for example, you can't have a, uh, a silver, you know, quality indicator for fill and have a gold for pack. It's knocked down to silver all the way to warp. Um, and we do this to make it a quick glance, you know, just quality indication of the amount of data you have, how it was tested, when it was tested. Keep in mind that we have so many different flavors of molding these days that you really need to put in perspective of, am I, am I characterizing the material uh, which would represent my process? You know, we've got low pressure um, type uh, processes out there, um, plunger injection molding machines out there today versus reciprocal screws. So there's a lot of variation that you may want to consider besides this as far as how the material is tested, but it's a great snapshot of where you stand in regards to the data. And typically we'll, we'll show a couple of examples. You're going to get better results as you go up the stack from you know, bronze to silver. And um, we, we include this as far as, uh, you know, a quick glance as far as what was tested. There's also a way to look at the report within the software. So things like multi-data points for thermal properties, that's something that we like to see these days. And, and um, single point is uh, you know, knocked down as far as a ranking. So that's one example. Thanks, Matt. And for those of you that weren't uh, in the session live yesterday, all the sessions are recorded. So when you go back to your lobby and go into the classes, you'll be able to um, replay those sessions. And I just grabbed some screenshots yesterday from the mold flow versus mold floor, just to kind of show a little bit more on the material quality index. Um, Jen and uh, Jason from um, the AIM Institute had talked about you know the importance of material characterization and they did show that um, they chose two of the same grade materials and one had a, a, a bronze level uh, MQI and one had a gold level MQI and you can see the the drastic differences between the pressure prediction so we see you know about 10,000 psi and 26,000 psi so you know, you kind of scratch your head when you get some of those results and uh, figure out well which one's right well they actually ran that one um, on the floor and came back and um, obviously the one that had more accurate material data in this particular case gave them the uh, most accurate results, you know, within, uh, you know, essentially a thousand PSI um, from the machine that they had um, 
discounting the machine losses. So, you know, doing an air shot with the same process and, and subtracting that out, which is the losses through the, the nozzle and the um, um, in the machine itself. And that's a good practice too, a good point to the using, leveraging the quality indicator um, as far as a gut check. Maybe you've got a material that's ranked low, but within that same family, you can quickly search on what materials in that family is ranked as, as gold um, that you can do a, a gut test with like this and see, hmm, is this affecting you know, what I'm after as far as results? Yeah, and I think a lot of people use the material quality index as uh, you know, kind of the, the catch-all for, oh, I'm guaranteed you know, accurate results. And we talked about it in the very beginning of the presentation. If you fall down on you know, the other four, uh, three of the four pillars besides material, um, you're, you're probably not going to get accurate results because you're not matching up your process, for instance, or you're not capturing the thickness on the model or you may be you know, using a, a solver technology that um, is not matching the assumptions of, of what you're actually doing in reality. Exactly. So I think it's important to you know, not dial in to just getting a gold material, but make sure that you're consistent throughout those four things that we talked about, the pillars, so that you, um, are, you know, are, are much more likely to get um, you know, accurate analysis. Because if you fall down in one, it, it's, it's gonna affect everything. You could have the best material data, you know, out there and still not get accurate results um, without the other three. Right. For for example, going back to you know matching what you're doing to the material and the type of material. I had an example where it was a unique material. It was low pressure, low flow rates, and a plunger style injection mold. And because of that, I, I had it tested differently than your garden variety thermoplastic. Um, so those are, you know, outside the box type of things that you have to consider to to tune um, based on what you're faced with as far as an application. Yep, totally understood. Um, yeah, just real quick, we got a question um, regarding the rheological model coefficients for the cross WLF model. That's our default model for viscosity. So the question was, um, what should I expect, you know, in terms of differences of behavior between a characterization with traditional um, capillary geometry or, or capillary geometry and injection molding rheometry? Um, so, so Nelson, thanks for the question. And uh, we're actually gonna answer that in um, one of the slides coming up. So I'm gonna, you know, hit pause on that one and we'll come back to it because we actually have a slide on that a little bit later. So we will uh, answer that live for you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think for material data source, you have to look at that as well. So obviously the material quality index has this within it. It's one of the um, you know, major stipulations of uh, grading a material. You know, where is it coming from? Um, how confident are we in the data? But um, a lot of times when we grab materials, sometimes we, we don't look at this and um, when you go into a material, if you see grade specific information, it typically will have this black text. So we kind of see that up at the top here. Um, the elastic modulus, Poisson, shear modulus, and our um, CTEs, our coefficient, uh, uh, coefficients of thermal expansion are all in black text. And that's an indicator to us visually that that has been measured. Those mechanicals, you know, the plaques have been, um, have been produced. The, we've you know cut the, the samples out of the plaque, and then we've actually you know pulled those apart. In this case, because it's a these are tensile properties, and we've done that with multiple samples, and then averaged those and put those into the uh, the database. If that hasn't been done, or if you've maybe not supplied that with a material data fit to the data fitting um, department, you will get. Um, supplemental mechanical properties. And those are, you know, kind of middle of the road generic properties that we've seen for that particular material grade. And you kind of see those indicated by the red text. So if you've ever seen any red text in the material file, you know, you'll know that um, may, may not be close to what you're actually doing, but it's in the middle of the road for that material. And obviously you can make a copy of this and modify those to see what the, um, the impact would be if it was higher or lower, or maybe you can find those properties 
uh, from your material supplier or from an online database like IDES or MatWeb or, or your favorite online database and you know you can modify those but know that you know the red um, indication in the text as you're going through the material UDB file the details of the material property you know will um, maybe question some of the uh, data that you're giving so it's if it's not measured how close is it is what you should be asking yourself yeah, and the mechanical data is uh, you know super important for warp so as far as a quality indicator for warp this would be less desirable and a lower ranking and, and another thing that's a flag is if you know your material is anisotropic you know you wouldn't expect um, the uh, modulus to be the same in flow cross flow. Um, and we see that that's a flag. We see that a lot with supplemental data where it's reported as the same value. Yeah, very good point. And then, uh, you know, finally, if you don't find your material in the database, um, you know, what do you look for? And how similar does it have to be for you, you know, to be able to use it? So a lot of times we'll look at, um, you know, indicators of viscosity index or a melt flow index. We'll look at um, if it's a filled material, trying to get, you know, a percentage filler that's exactly the same in the same family of materials. Um, and a lot of times it's best to maybe just reach out to the material supplier for that material and see if they have that particular grade. Because a lot of material suppliers, when you're a customer, will supply those to you. So although they may not be in the default database, they may want, um, you know, to have that as uh, their own confidential database and they'll supply that to you as, uh, as a customer of theirs. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later um, in the presentation about confidentiality and some of the trends that we're seeing there. But it's, it's good to know trend. that you should, <laughs> yeah, you definitely should uh, you know, involve your material supplier because you know, many times I've gone, um, when I'm working on projects myself to the material supplier, and they've been able to provide me with um, data I didn't know it ex existed, UDBs that you know they had on file. So it's a great practice to do. You know, as close as we are in relationships with the material suppliers, um, you know, Moleflow doesn't always have you know the most um, um, up-to-date uh, information or every single material inside of uh, the database. And then just one quick uh, other thing, I, I just, again, grabbed a screenshot from yesterday with um, the presentation on mold flow versus more mold floor, because I found this interesting. They, um, uh, Jen and Jason had looked at uh, six, di six different material characterizations for the same grade of polycarbonate. Um, you know, there happened to be, um, you know, six different versions of the same grade, uh, some from different regions and some that actually had some different fillers in it. It had some different designations, but it was the same grade. Um, you know, some had some um, uh, heat stabilizers and some other things in it. So obviously that would change some of these properties that we'll, um, we'll be talking about. But they ran it through the same exact um, mesh, same part, same runners, same um, process. And they got um, you know six different results, and they did that also by having the runner system be all beams, and then the runner system being all 3D. So you can see kind of the range of um, you know for what is considered to be the same grade material um, in terms of pressure prediction. So we have you know almost up to basically 20, uh, 25,000 somewhere around there, um, down to you know like. 8,000, something like that. So the range was um, pretty drastic between the analysis results. So it just kind of goes to show that you definitely want to do your homework on what you're going to use. And as you're selecting a material, you know, we talked about the material quality index being something that shows you the completeness of, uh, or completeness of the material. Definitely, you know, two things that you want to look at as you're um, doing your analysis results to try to get um, you know, matching between what you're seeing in reality and uh, in simulation. And Brian, here's a you know great example of uh, you know looking at different material data sources. I wonder if you can walk us through this one. 
Yeah, this is um, just three, you know, polypropylenes uh, with the same uh, melt flow index, which a lot of folks use um, and get fooled with. It's really a better indication of molecular weight opposed to uh, flow properties or viscosity at the shear rates that we see in injection molding. But your your first uh oh is uh, unknown. The the unknown source is. Uh, always a head scratcher in suspect and something that's going to get knocked down as far as the uh, quality indication and supplemental, you know, that's really um, uh, an average of the family base. And I've seen this kind of evolve where, you know, when this was fit, maybe there was only 10 materials in the database, but now there's, 25 of that same type of material. So that can improve over time. And I was victim of this as far as it, the average, and we'll see an example of this being way off of what was actually on the, the molding floor. Um, things like uh, injection molding, uh, rheometer versus uh, a calip, uh, yeah, the standard calip, well, I'm having a hard time talking this morning. Uh, rheometer is uh, the benchtop rheometer is, um, you know, not necessarily marked down, but again, you will see in a slide as you know Nelson brought that question up earlier that it may, it will be different than the injection molding rheometer. So it's something to consider. In the case that I brought up earlier, it was actually beneficial to characterize it like a, a plunger style, a, a capillary rheometer, um, because it, it mimicked my, my process for that material. But supplemental mechanical is a killer for, you know, warpage predictions. Um, and another thing to notice here is this material on the, the right, is marked gold, but doesn't have shrink data. So there's, you know, some things that we want to see there. Um, shrink data is absolutely beneficial, even from a, a data standpoint. It is a, a complete design of experiments on shrink data. You've got process variations um, and uh, reports on flow, cross flow, and volumetric shrinkage. It's a treasure chest that you don't typically get from a lot of the material suppliers unless they've done specific studies. But this next uh, curve that Matt's gonna show here kind of shows you how you gotta be cautious of you know, PVT. Th this drives the compressible flow model, right? And um, as, as we get into um, um, solidification and, uh, and onto warp, um, so it can have a, a huge impact uh, all the way through the process. And that um, injection molding rheometer versus the capillary are the blue and red. So they kind of map out close, but you can see a specific difference. And the oddball in the bottom, the black curve is, you know, that supplemental data. So you can see that the material was listed as it was a similar material, similar melt flow index, same types of application for this polypropylene, but we're way, way off on that PVT data as far as a, a true average of these two materials on the top anyway. Yeah, Brian, I think we can forgive you for, uh, you know, talking. I can't talk it. I'm three hours ahead of you. So you're, you're still seven <laughs> in the morning. So <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely need the third cup of coffee. So. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. No, and I, I just wanted to point out a few things that, that Brian said as well, um, you know, the shrink data, and I tend to use that myself because of, you know, you just don't find that data anywhere, and it's for, you know, a design of experiment of different thicknesses, different process conditions, um, and what's great about that is you can kind of, you know, get close to what you're using in terms of your nominal wall thickness, you can look at your process and get an idea of an ideal situation of where your your shrink is, you know, parallel uh, cross flow type of shrinkage because, you know, we're doing these on, you know, tag dies, long, um, you know, rectangles essentially. So it doesn't necessarily get any easier than that. Uh, so if you're seeing shrinkages that are, you know, two, three times that in your model, you know, you got a really good baseline to go to what the ideal is and what to expect. 
Um, it also is a nice comparison when you get shrinkage values from your material supplier. And um, for those of you that weren't in the presentation yesterday, uh, Tim from uh, CAE, CAE Services um, went through a, a COVID project that he worked on a ventilator with a few parts on that. And he had mentioned, you know, some of the shrink values that they were getting in uh, a couple different uh, simulation packages, not just ours, and how they varied widely um, for the same exact material. So, you know, knowing that that's in there and being able to compare that to what you're getting from your material supplier, um, you just have another data point so that, um, you know, again, it's at ideal conditions, it's at a flat plate, but you can see how much it varies based on process, uh, thickness, and you get a much better um, confidence of going in and recommending shrink values as, a, as an analyst if you're, you know, doing warpage and those types of things. And he was getting into windage, you know, which is always um, uh, somewhat difficult because you have to, you know, really start using, you know, things like ram speed profiles and matching what the machine's doing because, you um, you know, inaccuracies between, you know, filling and packing and, and finally you get the warpage. If you didn't get those things right before it, it just, you know, things start to fall apart and um, recommending windage based on, you know, just defaults, you know, is always uh, something that, you know, I, I start to shake at uh, and, and get the shivers because, you know, you have to really, um, you know, dial in the process in order to, to get that. But I just wanted to mention that, Brian. Yeah, great point. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, something else we should take a look at, uh, you know, speaking of warpage, is um, we talked about, you know, a lot of these different material properties that we have and measured versus single, um, you know, multi-point data versus single data. So we see a study here that was done with um, what we, you know, lovingly call our corner, corner mold die. Um, so essentially it's a, a, a flat plate that's bent. You know, we actually uh, just, it goes, you know, 90 degrees into the, um, the tool and then we eject that out. And then, you know, for different processing conditions, we can look at, you know, both the shrinkage values on here. And then also um, for those of you that use, um, you know, mid-plane uh, technology, you'll see some corner effects that are built into the software. You can have the option of turning that on. And a lot of that we get from, um, tests like this to see what the shrinkage is at, at corners. With 3D, it's uh, kind of automatically built in and to a certain extent, um, dual domain also does um, a little bit better of a job at that, but still a planar technology, so corner effects would, uh, would apply there as well. So we see here that we have, um, you know, a, a, a part fan gated in, and then we measure the angle um, from the bottom uh, to the top because it's a, a corner. We always typically see it shrinking in. Uh, again, uh, you know, based on the, the warpage of uh, certain materials. And we see that, um, as Brian had mentioned, supplemental mechanicals caused about a 12% difference to the, the actual, the measured values that we received. Um, we see our full material data. And again, this is, you know, multi-point data, you know, essentially an MQI of a gold standard for the mesh type. And Brian kind of mentioned that as well. Uh, just because the material is gold, again, just want to point out, it's, it's the completeness, uh, completeness of the material. You may have uh, no shrinkage data. And if you're using you know, mid-plane and dual domain technology, um, you know, having that crims shrinkage data you know, would give you the most accurate uh, warpage prediction. So you definitely have to look at that when you're determining um, the completeness of the material. What mesh type are you actually using in, in your analysis itself. And we see with, um, you know, single values, um, you know, for our specific heat and for our thermal conductivity, supplemental mechanical data, you see just, you know, just bouncing back and, and forth. And we, we haven't got into it yet, but we will talk about, um, you know, materials that are a little bit more pressure sensitive and we need to, you know, add things like um, juncture loss or um, uh, pressure dependent viscosity. But you see how much it varies based on you know supplemental properties and also supplemental um, uh, data for for PVT, for instance, and mechanicals. So you see sometimes we may be okay. And actually, um, you know, from supplemental PVT standpoint, the material that we used was very very close, and we kind of pointed that out in here. The supplemental PVT, although it uh, was a three percent difference, 
it was actually very, very close to the mid range of the supplemental that we were using. And that's not always the case. Sometimes yeah, it may that be comparison, drastically off. Yeah, that comparison of the curves we show is an important thing to do. In some cases, you're fine. In other cases, you see the, the difference that we saw in that curve. And that's when to relook at that and see if you can get it tested or to average it better. Yeah, I think it goes back to that comparison that you did, Brian. A lot of um, customers that I see don't know that you can select multiple materials and hit the compare button to maybe compare PBT and see, you know, how far it is. And you can do that with, you know, viscosity and a lot of the other properties as well. It's a great practice to get into. Um, like we saw those six um, polycarbonates that, you know, gave us different pressure predictions. We could, you know, put several of those in a compare and see, you know, how far off are the properties between one and another. And um, where does the material quality index stand to give us some confidence that we're using the material that is going to give us the, uh, the most accurate results. But in this case, the supplemental mechanicals, as Brian just pointed out, it's typically the, uh, the usual suspect when we um, have drastic warpage you know, under prediction or over prediction, um, a lot of it has to do with using mechanicals that are supplemental. Um, another thing, especially for uh, hygroscopic materials, you know, materials like nylon that absorb mo moisture, we see that um, a lot of times in practice, we see a lot of dryers and we see them, you know, people practicing what look like really good. Um, drying procedures, but then they throw it into um, a very large barrel, or excuse me, a hopper, and um, that's exposed to atmosphere. So they're, they're losing some of, you know, all the work they put into getting the moisture out is then put back in because they're in a, you know, maybe a non-controlled environment in terms of the HVAC. Um, you know, it's not air conditioned, the temperature varies. So when it's got the, you know, the back uh, door open, because uh, it's, you know, it, it's hot or stuffy. So you see some of these things happening as well. So you do have to, you know, really take that into consideration when you're trying to match, you know, actual simulation results over to um, reality because moisture will have an effect. And we see that here. And for most of these materials, it acts like a, a plasticizer. So um, as Brian mentioned, you know, melt flow index and, you know, be, really being related to molecular weight. This is this, you know, essentially what it's doing. It's it's breaking down those chains so that we get you know a lower molecular weight. So it has a, a strong influence on the rheological and mechanical properties of the material. And we see a couple of um, uh, charts that we pulled out from a, a couple papers, and um, we can give you the references for these. But viscosity versus shear rate, as we um, take a look at um, adding moisture or, or letting a material sit for multiple hours. And what does the viscosity look like when we dry the material? And then we go in and uh, you know measure it 24 hours later, 48 hours later, um, those types of things. It's gonna absorb that moisture over time and uh, affect what the viscosity is. And again, if we are drying the material and then putting into a large hopper that's exposed to an environment that has moisture, it's going to behave like this. So we need to you know definitely take that into consideration. And again, not just viscosity, but also mechanicals. If we look at modulus, we see the effect of, um, you know, relative humidity on a, a, a material. It's in, you know, definitely temperature related, but also the relative humidity really um, changes what happens to that material. And we get different modulus values. And as we saw before, we put one into the database. Um, and for each direction. If we have supplemental material, as Brian pointed out, it's typically the same in both directions. So we don't even get an inflow cross flow direction. And we're just not capturing some of the things that actually happen as moisture is added in. So definitely something that you want to take a look at. And, um, you know, when are you measuring the parts after they're molded? Are they in um, a humidity controlled environment? And what temperature are they going to be, um, you know, service loaded at um, in reality. Yeah, my so, first ex layman's experience with this was with a nylon crimp uh, application. And I was uh, third shift on a molding floor and saw someone 
parts were in a, a plastic bag and saw someone pour water into the bag and I thought they were just upset with the foreman. <laughs> and uh, it, I mean, that changes the performance, the mechanical properties and, and was part of the procedure of packing those parts up. So huge influence on not just uh, rheology, uh, but end of end part performance as well, yeah. Yeah, very common for uh, cable ties, zip ties, right? For exactly, you to, exactly. To put some moisture in before you uh, you ship them out, and it's 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 just a um, a way of um, making it so that they they have the properties that they want um, when it gets to the consumer. Yeah, and I think you know another interesting area to to kind of take a look at before we finally get to Nelson's question. He's been waiting all this time for us to talk about uh, injection molding. It's reality. the only one so far. So keep, <laughs> you know, you guys yeah, need to uh, need to pick up the questions uh, here. And, yeah, I thought this this was an ask. The the experts. Yeah, I was going to uh, say that was the first yeah, word yeah, used. In we should have we should have called it the lecture uh, from the from from the experts. No worries. We still uh, got maybe five minutes, and then we'll just turn it to an open. Kind of yeah. Session. yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, melt preparation. I mean, uh, as we um, process the material in the barrel um, in the injection molding machine, um, there are many times, especially for you know contract manufacturers, that um, uh, they have a certain amount of uh, machines and sizes, and you try to match up the machine as uh, close to possible so that you don't uh, have a long resonance time. But if you're doing, you know, micro molding and you don't, you know, necessarily do it all the time, you're going to have, you know, kind of a mismatch between the resonance uh, time in the barrel um, compared to the shot size that you're doing. So the length of that resonance time really um, can have a significant effect on the material itself. And we kind of, you know, see that here with um, some relative viscosity for uh, a polypropylene, um, a POM, and, and a nylon material, you know, what effect that has um, over the delay time. So you see, you know, polypropylene, again, a uh, very linear type of chain material, not a lot of, we'll just call it shrubbery on the side of it, as opposed to, uh, you know, some of the other materials that have a lot more, um, you know, pendant chains and, and those types of things on the side of their main carbon backbone of material and you see that effect where it starts to break down um, you know some of those things that make it stronger so we see that that delay time the amount of residence time that you have can really significantly um, affect the viscosity and therefore uh, the properties as well and for fiber filled materials if we're you know constantly moving that barrel and and having that mechanical shear action going across the flutes of the uh, the screw and pressure pressurizing it um, we're going to get you know some breakage in the barrel and not to mention as it goes through the you know the check ring valve if we have any screen pack in it especially if it's filled um, going through you know gates nozzle those types of things anything that's going to you know divert that flow put stress on um, those fibers you know would introduce a, a breakage so not only just in the barrel, but you know downstream as well. So we can see the effect of that as well um, on aspect ratio as we uh, um, break it down. The viscosity obviously will will change as well. So we should consider that. Um, so here's a, an image of um, our lab down in uh, Melbourne, Australia, in Kilsith. And we're finally going to get to our, Nelson's question. <laughs> we're finally going to get to Nelson's question. Um, there, uh, boy, I don't know if they've opened up yet. They were closed down because of the uh, the pandemic. Um, but I think if it's not this week, it was next week that uh, they were going to open back up again. So it, it literally looks like this. I guess there's you know one guy over there, but um, the he didn't get the uh, memo to he didn't get the memo. Photo shoot <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, we use an injection molding uh, rheometer, and this is getting back to, to Nelson's question. And um, you know, we, we kind of see it in here, but I wanted to at least you know show one of the. Uh, and Steve the made pictures. a great comment too. If if you all didn't see that in the chat, um, in regards to the the differences in his experience too, but go ahead, Matt. Yeah. Um, so with an injection molding rheometer, we we essentially modify the the end of the barrel of an injection molding machine and the modification just looks like an extension of the barrel 
And inside of there, we can put um, different capillary dyes, you know, that have different L over D ratios, different diameters, and that automatically allows us to do things like uh, Rabinowitz correction and, and power law type of juncture losses and those types of things. So we measure um, both uh, pressure sensors and, and melt um, sensors, but you know, before and after each of the dyes. And then we also have um, at the very end, a restriction area where we can start to look at the effect of uh, pressure on viscosity as well. So we can um, uh, apply a restriction, then that will um, you know, modify um, the, the pressure inside of those, those dyes because we're restricting it going out. And then we can look at the effects of you know, pressure on viscosity. Uh, for those materials that uh, that experience that, and then you know, typical typical capillary rheometer would just have you know essentially a die with um, with a barrel, and we just force material at um, you know a certain force through the um, the die, and we do that at different temperatures, and record um, you know essentially a weight per um, you know ten minutes or whatever the the time factor is, and that you know can give us an indication of um, melt flow index. But when we do it with a capillary rheometer, we are looking at different you know, rates. And we're trying to get up to the shear that um, an ejection molding machine can do. But typically, a capillary rheometer cannot get to that, that level for, for most injection molding um, processes. So that's why we feel that the um, injection molding rheometer um, is the preferred method. And we also um, get the history. You now we talked about fiber breakage in the barrel, but the heat history of the material is very similar. Whereas, you know, in an injection molding rheometer versus a capillary rheometer, where we just kind of put pellets in, let them melt for a, a dwell time, if you will, and then apply pressure. So, you know, we essentially just try to make sure that they're melted. And again, we said that dwell time affects properties. So, you know we're inherently having um, some residence time built in in order to just melt those pellets and we don't have the um, same heat history as we would in injection molding. So we typically find that um, you know the injection molding rheometer gives us a more accurate injection molding simulation because it's using the same process. And we see um, you know a couple uh, viscosity curves from a straight injection molding or excuse me a, a straight capillary rheometer. Um, where we've you know modified the temperatures, um, took it through the die, um, and we're getting very you know linear power law basically uh, type of response on this particular material. But when we use the same material and we take it through an injection molding rheometer, um, we get a similar function at the very high shear rates. Um, actually, a little bit off, a little bit different. So if you actually you know draw the line over. Um, we, we are a, a little bit higher on the scale as opposed to, because we just can't get to these high shear rates, so we have to interpolate these based on the slope of the curve over, um, which is why we start to get what we feel is more accurate. Now, in the lower shear rates, we tend to plateau, and at the higher shear rates, we kind of get this transition period where um, you know, we start to get more of this um, power law type of uh, functionality, and that's why we tend to default on the cross WLF model because it captures both of those regimes uh, very well. But what that does in terms of, um, again, there's a kind of a representation of our tag die where we have a fan gate um, into a long rectangular section. When we ran this um, with this uh, particular pressure point, we got a curve on um, a particular flow rate for one of our tests. And we used this data to simulate the same um, process with capillary rheometer uh, data for viscosity and we used injection molding rheology um, as well and as you can see with the capillary uh, rheology we, we kind of you know spike in pressure um, much quicker and at a different slope than reality and when we use the uh, injection molding uh, rheology we were much much closer um, to predicting the pressure so it just shows that you know to answer your question uh, Nelson We've seen um, these types of differences where, um, and it may be below and it may be above, it depends on that fit, but because we're, we're doing um, lower shear rates, we can kind of, you know, somewhat get into the, right between that 10,000 and 1,000 range is really where most uh, 
rheometers and we use a, 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 a dual bore um, ceased uh, type of uh, rheometer for our, our capillary rheometer. But um, so there are some where you can approach, you know, the kind of this 10, uh, uh, 10,000 range, but we can't definitely can't get up into, you know, the million range. So really with injection molding rheometry, we're getting those accurate points where um, quite frankly, a lot of the injection molding is done. We're typically don't see most people going slower and um, you know, using lower temperatures in the regimes down here. But as we get to the end of packing, we definitely you know, can get um, gate freeze off and those types of things better with uh, uh, injection molding rheometry as well. So it kind of serves both purposes of getting us better on the higher ranges and also um, you know, for the lower ranges um, as well. I don't know if you had anything to add there, Brian, but uh, I felt like I was uh, going on there for a rant for a while. <laughs> That's all good. Yep. Uh, yeah, just an original comment. Ooh, yeah. Yep. Uh, as far as it, it, you know, there's some, as Steve mentioned, materials that you just, you need to go with the capillary rheometer. Um, but uh, there's also some processes that may be better represented that way too. So it is a little application specific sometimes. Uh, and yeah, the next slide is, you know, really if you look at the, the cross WLF model um, on the next slide, this was a lesson that, that I learned. Um, uh, we have this pressure coefficient D3. Sometimes uh, uh, we've ignored it in the past. Um, and started to you know, apply, you start seeing this showing up in the, in the database uh, today. Uh, we still quite often have to request for it because um, it is tricky to characterize and fit. But as meant, Matt mentioned before, as far as the pillars, if you're looking at system pressure, you need to model the system. And this was a big aha for me on, on this particular project um, in regards to flow rate, in-cavity flow rate, is drastically off if you don't model the system because of compressible flow. And the chart over here is, you know, just a comparison of PVT data that drives that compressible flow. And the impact is not just flow rate, you know, it's just, it's a domino effect, um, shear, uh, oh, frozen layer buildup. Like it, it, from the gate, you're like in trouble if you don't get that flow rate right. Next slide, Matt. And here was the big wide eyed open, oh wow, <laughs> right? So we modeled this uh, without compressible effects and it was a symmetry approach where it was a four cavity and we used a occurrence um, values to, to match that. But the ideal flow rate for this particular part was one cubic, uh, 0.1 cubic inch per second. So without any compressible effects, you just you know split that out four times and you, you know, you need something like 0.4 cubic inches per second to, to deliver that cavity flow rate. In the system, we found that it was almost double. We needed to have double that flow rate in order to get that cavity flow rate. And, and again, to the, the Beaumont slide that Matt added earlier, um, we found that modeling the feed system, the uh, feed system 3D actually improved accuracy as well. So it was a combination of things. And I see a lot of folks like trying to hit the easy button with D3, but the point here is that there are other components um, to accuracy. Yep, definitely agree. And then um, I think we'll use this as our last topic, Brian, and then a couple questions came in and I did want to address um, some of the chats as well. So um, we mentioned it, you know, in the very beginning, the confidentiality of material and you know although moldflow has you know, you know extremely large database and um, you know brian and i are involved with the beta program and for those of you that that aren't um, involved with uh, beta for for moldflow we will um, you know just reach out to us and we'll send you a link to the um, the site but uh, it, everybody's um, allowed to, to go ahead and participate in the beta um, for the, the 2021 release. And you get to see some of the new features in there. But I did notice that um, you know, we were well over 11,200 and some materials in the database now. But obviously that's, <laughs> that's not every single material that uh, is in existence. So um, a lot of times to protect the data, um, 
know, especially for those that have, you know, a lot of proprietary work. Some people compound their own material and put their, uh, you know, special spin or, you know, I think Brian likes to call it foo-foo dust in, into it. <laughs> um, you know, whether that's a fiber or a stabilizer, um, you know, an additive. Sometimes a, a mineral of some sort for either stabilization of uh, heat or warp, you know, stabilized shrinkage. And it's left out in the, the mechanical aspect. And that's a, a danger or trend. We need to, to have the mechanical data of all these components um, in order to, you know, have the proper micromechanics for accurate warpage predictions. So that's uh, one kind of thing that we need to be cautious of when we see confidential data and we have no way of knowing what that is. Yeah, and again, it's there to protect the uh, you know the IP of the of the com company that um, it was absolutely yeah. getting that data in. So a lot of times, you know, I would reach out, um, you know, to the company, and a lot of times they'll give you you know the answer to your questions without revolving or revealing any of the uh, IP that they have of um, you know what you're looking at. So I guess Brian, this is a you know a good example of um, you know some of the properties that that would be hidden. Typically, um, see right. Yeah. Um, so and we, and the next one is a unique way around that. <laughs> so one one supplier just did a unknown. You, you and actually provided the, the mechanical data. I thought that was cute. <laughs> yeah. So that is a note that if you uh, even if you try to hide it with unknown without using that confidential um, designation, it um, you can still see the properties because they they are in there. Um, so something to take a look at. Well, cool. Um, well, that's all we had for um, presentation. And wow, we went pretty darn long. Yeah, we uh, had a good question in regards to um, what do you do when, you know, EDB files not available from the okay. supplier. Um, and, you know, are there particular properties uh, other than the Melflow index, um, which... <sighs> You know, I may add that to the column for comparison, but there is a, a unique uh, mole flow um, property called uh, the mole flow uh, viscosity index, which um, represents uh, the viscosity at a specific temperature at a high shear rate. I think at this thousand reciprocal seconds. So that's a great indication of are you coming close, you know, to that um, behavior out on the molding floor with that material um, and a combination of uh, comparing thermals now that we've got so much multi-point data um, and mechanicals to, to make sure that, you know, everything is aligned with that as similar as you can get. But for viscosity specifically, the, the mole flow index is a unique one that uh, I don't, it's like a hidden gem in there. Totally agree. And the, um, we actually have a kind of a video that goes over some of the properties that we try to, to match up. Obviously you want it in the same, you know, family of materials, you try to get the same grade of materials, but there, there is kind of a list of a checklist that we go through. But again, a lot of times I'll go back to the material supplier because most of them will have, you know, a department that's doing mold flow analysis and they've gone through, cause you know, obviously they're trying to, make it as easy as possible to use their materials. And they have a department that normally would do mold flow simulations. And they've kind of gone through some of that. So a lot of times I've gotten, you know, very, very good hints and tips from the material suppliers on, you know, well, I use, you know, this grade of material because it's not in the database. Um, and it may be one that I, I scratched my head. I'm like, I'm not sure why you're using that. And you go back and, you know, very similar viscosity properties and it, uh, it works well. And um, so just goes to show that, you know, the communication is pretty key. And if you need, um, you know, some help with that, obviously we, we can, um, you know, help to get the, you know, the connections if, uh, if you're having trouble, um, especially, you know, some of the students that we have on the, at the summit, um, you know, it's tough if you're not, you know, buying these Gaylords of material uh, to go in and, and get the attention of, of somebody. So it, it depends on um, money sometimes talks, <laughs> sometimes, but 
yeah. but sometimes we can help out in, in those scenarios when you're doing uh, you know, research. Nelson had a, a, an interesting um, additional comment to junction loss versus D3, and uh, which would have a, a, a bigger important in that. We've got guidelines as far as where D3 is important, like material types, clumsy molecules like polycarbonate stick out, um, long flow lengths with uh, thin wall, uh, thickness to flow length ratios. Um, there's guidelines there. In general, with like a large um, high pressure, you know, molding, which you'd see with thin walled components, we, we see D3 being a, a larger component. But, you know, it, there's other materials and other um, products where it has very, very little to no influence. Um, so, yeah, it depends on the application. All right. Well, that brings us to our hour. We filled it. Congratulations. <laughs> so if anybody else has any other um, questions or anything, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're fairly easy to get a hold of. Um, you know, first name dot last name at autodesk.com. So I'm Matthew Jaworski and that Polish name will maybe uh, get you. J-A-W-O-R-S-K-I. I an I on the end of that <laughs> or Y rather. <laughs> yeah. and then we got Brian Pelly. Which is with a Y at the end. <laughs> P-E-L-L-E-Y. But thank you all for attending and um, have a great rest of the Advanced Manufacturing Summit. Yeah, enjoy. Later. Bye. Bye.